A Tale as Old as Time, a real game changer in animation which raised the bar, giving respect to animation as a legitimate art form. Today we're talking about Beauty and the Beast, coming up. Hey animation fans, Animator Talk here to celebrate the art of animation and its contribution to entertainment of yesterday, today, and into the future. Under the sea. Under the sea. After the success of The Little Mermaid, lyricist Howard Ashman had thought he had the perfect follow-up to his Under the Sea masterpiece. The story of Aladdin and his ma magic lamp. Oh, okay. Ever since he was a little boy in New York City, Howard loved the story of Aladdin. Performing it himself on stage as a child, he always had an affinity for this story and thought it would be perfect to succeed The Little Mermaid. He and his collaborating partner, Alan Menken, devised a story treatment and presented it to the studio along with a list of brand new songs on demo tape. He asked them what they had thought and they thanked him and asked to shelve it for a possible next project. They had a film already in production, and it was floundering. They suggested that Howard and Alan were just what they needed to save this film. Then they handed them a copy of the screenplay to Beauty and the Beast. Now we all know Beauty and the Beast, that magnificent film that cemented that The Little Mermaid wasn't just a fluke, and that the studio had entered into the new renaissance age of animation. The film won awards, had a hit single on the pop charts, a hit show on Broadway, and merchandising was everywhere. But back in 1987, it began with serious troubles. The true beginnings of Disney's involvement with this tale as old as time really began with Walt himself. Ever the proponent for classic fairy tales, Walt put his best story men on the project. However, much like 1987's story men, they were having a lot of trouble coming up with a decent story. Once World War II hit, all of Walt's feature films were put on hold while the studio focused on their attention on wartime propaganda films for the military. That was the end of Beauty and the Beast for a few decades. It wasn't until the studio was in the thick of production on Who Framed Roger Rabbit when it was decided to dust off the old files. The studio approached and hired English animation director Richard Purdom, who would direct under producer Don Hahn. Purdom imagined an old 17th century period story. Several of Disney's top animators, including Glenn Keane, Andreas Deja, and Tom Cito, were relocated to England to work on the film in a satellite studio. After spending several months on the production, Don Hahn would fly to Burbank to show what they had for the first 20 minutes of film. Once they saw the production reels, it was obvious Jeffrey Katzenberg wasn't happy, and he did the unthinkable. He threw out the entire treatment and ordered the film begin again from scratch. Nice going. You see, the studio felt it wasn't exciting. It was dark and slow, and being that it wasn't originally going to be a musical, it needed a whole new story treatment. Purdom was holding true to his original treatment, but it lacked that Disney feel. After a few weeks of fighting for his film and once it changed into something he no longer believed in, Purdom stepped down as director. In efforts to replace Purdom, the studio asked John Musker and Ron Clements. They declined after just coming off a of directing Mermaid and needed to regroup. Heads turned to a couple of storyboard artists for first-time directors, Kirk Wise and Gary Trousdale. They had just proven themselves after having directed the animated segments of a popular Epcot attraction called Cranium Command. Now, since the days when Walt led the studio, Disney feature films had been written by a story team, and usually strictly by storyboard. New ideas would replace old by replacing old storyboard panels with new drawings, tacked to those bulletin boards. But Michael Eisner liked scripts. It's how Hollywood works on story. He hired screenwriter Linda Wolverton to rewrite Beauty. Jeffrey dropped the finished screenplay on the table and the story team was to storyboard what was already written. That caused a lot of turmoil with the story team. 
neither side understood the other's process and led to a lot of butting of heads. Linda would come in one morning to find dialogue or whole scenes rewritten. The story team would come in and find whole boards being tampered with. The situation forced them into sharing an office space. They learned to work together, and the story's evolution benefited greatly with that collaboration. But one can argue the most substantial contributor to the story was Howard Ashman. Now, as I said before, Beauty and the Beast wasn't originally going to be a musical. Rewrites and further character development weren't enough to save this picture. So when Howard and Alan Menken joined the production, they saw the potential of making this a musical that could rival Broadway. As a matter of fact, all of the actors cast to the film who had singing parts were veterans of Broadway. Years before, Howard poured his soul into Smile, a musical that failed miserably on Broadway. So he felt he had something to prove to the musical community. Within the first several pages of the screenplay, Howard found not only the introduction to our heroine, Belle, but he found his I Want song. And it would be sweeping and huge. There must be more than this provincial life. Beauty was finally off to a good start. It generally takes three to four years to complete an animated feature. But with the original version taking up a year and a half of its time, and the release date was already set for November of 91, there was no time to lose. It was late into the process when the secondary characters were further developed. Characters like the lead servants were given their characteristics a little late in the game. It was thought that the character of Lumiere, which translates into light in French, was a romantic, and being hot, it was thought he would be a candelabra, whose flames dimmed and grew depending on his emotions. <laughs> Cogsworth was the one who oversaw the entire crew. They made his character a mantle clock, who was obsessed with keeping schedule to the point of stressing out, and he had nervous tics like the second hand of a clock. It was Howard who thought the teapot should be British, and his first casting suggestion was to be Angela Lansbury. It was then when Howard started pushing his suggestions for casting. The film's truncated schedule did take its toll on the film's final product. Being they only had about a year and a half to produce the new version, character design and animation suffered, as they didn't have enough time to allow the character designs to evolve properly before final animation. Which meant, though beautifully animated throughout, the characters would often go off-model depending on the animation sequence. The film is exquisite despite, and once you take a look at that ballroom dance scene, man, all imperfections are forgotten. The studio decided the crew needed to test this film, though the film was in various stages of production. In Hollywood, that version of a film is known as a work print, and used to keep a close eye on the progress of the film. The studio submitted the work print to the New York Film Festival. Directors Gary and Kirk were on the edge of their seats in anticipation for the audience's reaction. You see, the studio doesn't usually show a patchwork film like this, filled with storyboards, pencil tests, rough animation. But they were that evening. Everyone was relieved to witness the audience erupt in applause after that opening song. And then again, after all of the following song numbers. And finally, a standing ovation as the credits rolled. Sadly, Howard would never see the finished film. He lost his battle to AIDS in 1991. The studio decided to dedicate Beauty and the Beast in his memory. To our friend Howard, who gave a mermaid her voice and a beast his soul, we will be forever grateful. Beauty was released on November 22nd of 1991. The critics wrote raved reviews, and Beauty was the third most successful film of 1991, after only Terminator 2 and Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Beauty and the Beast was the highest grossing animated feature film of all time, bringing in over $331 million. The film won a Golden Globe for Best Picture, 
Then on February 19th, the Academy of Motion Pictures nominated Beauty for Best Picture. Now, they lost to Silence of the Lambs, but to be nominated for such an award gave Disney Animation and the animation community the legitimacy it deserved. It was no longer seen as just a children's medium. Adults started taking their dates to see Disney feature films after that. As a matter of fact, my first ever date was to see Aladdin a year later. Beauty also took home Oscars for Best Original Song for Beauty and the Beast, and Best Original goes. Score. Two, Alan Menken for Beauty and the Beast. The Golden Globe for Best Original Song and Best Score, and a Grammy for the Best Instrumental Composition and Best Song Written for a Motion Picture. The film inspired a, well, less than inspirational direct-to-video sequel, an amazing Broadway stage show, and a truncated stage show at Walt Disney World, which opened on the film's release date. Oh, hey, did you know? Check it out! The Beast has a name? Yes, even though his servants call him Master, and I always found it funny that even in the most tender of moments, Belle would refer to him as Beast. While never said in the film, the prince's name is Adam. Maurice almost went to Disneyland? Yes, confused and lost, Maurice, while stopped at a fork in the road, finds a signpost with some worn away signs. If you look closely, one side would lead him to Valencia, while another would lead him to Anaheim, which is where Disneyland is located. Come on for me, it's a shortcut. Be Our Guest was meant for somebody else? Yep, the song Be Our Guest was originally sung to Maurice in an earlier draft. The musical number would take place just before Beast imprisons Maurice. Did you know out of the entire cast of characters in this film, Gaston and Beast are the only two who share a similar characteristic? Oh, it's true. They are the only two characters in the entire film with bright blue eyes. As a matter of fact, they're even the same shade of blue. While Beast's eyes are soulful and kind, Gaston's are gainful and hide evil intention. That was never more true than just before his demise. Ew. How long has the Beast been under his spell? Well, keen observers will find the Beast has been under that spell for 21 years, while his servants have only been under the effects of the spell for 10. If you pay close attention to the Broadway show, as their time progresses, their transformation becomes more and more gradual, until that last pedal falls and it's irreversible. Belle reads Romeo and Juliet. While not the book given to her in the beginning of the film, when Beast gifts Belle his entire library, in the special edition of the film, the book she teaches him to read is that of Shakespeare's story. Beauty and the Beast wasn't just another animated feature from the House of Mouse. This film was a juggernaut for the industry as a whole. One that changed the perception of animation from a simple child's medium to a real legitimate art form. And it also helped usher in films like Aladdin, The Lion King, Mulan. 331 million, Golden Globes, Oscars, Grammys. Not bad for a film whose production was in serious trouble from the beginning. I want to thank you very much, everyone. Keep moving forward. Mm -hmm.